Welcome to Smith Location Agricultural High School. Regular be the Board of Trustees. Today is Tuesday, September 17th. May I call for an order? Mr. Kaling? Present. Mr. Aquadro? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Here. Dr. Bonner? Here. Mayor Ciara? Here. May we all stand for a pleasure of leave. Participation by the public this evening. We're going to bring you up late. <coughs> We're bringing you up in a minute. Okay. Uh, at this time, we have some official business to do. Uh, Andy? Sure. Uh, so, it is my pleasure uh, to start this presentation by referring back to uh, the Looking Back articles that are often found in the, in the Gazette. And I would ask the board and anybody in the public. Looking back on this date, September 17th, back in 2001, does anybody know what happened on this date in 2001? Uh, she does. <laughs> that Ms. Carver started working here? That is correct. You get the gold star, wow. Dr. Spencer Robinson. So, 23 years ago today, wow. uh, Ms. Carver. That's poetic. It is. Uh, Ms. Carver started here at Smith Vocational, and uh, this evening marks Ms. Carver's final Board of Trustees meeting. She will be celebrating later this evening, Ms. Carver. So, On behalf of myself and, and the leadership team and the faculty, and obviously on behalf of the Board of Trustees, you know, we really do thank you, Ms. Carver, for your service. Uh, it's been an honor to work with you. And uh, with that said, we do have the ceremonial clock to provide you, and I think there's some other uh, presentations other to also give you as well. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, we'll do the clock first. responsible for the absolutely beautiful display in the Smith Oak Barn. I was especially impressed by how full the space was with so many uh, impressive vehicles as well as the high interest displays for each shop. It was so easy to feel very proud of this school. I also caught the school bus demolition derby and although our bus didn't win, it sure looked good and it lasted a long time. Uh, you may remember that I'm a member of the Vocational Technical Education Advisory Council to the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. 
I've been asked to share my experience as a parent and a school committee member with implementing the 2019 CTE admission regulation updates at a special board CTE admissions study session. That's a lot, but essentially um, sharing my experience with the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education as they review the uh, implementation of the policy five years in. I've already asked Dr. Lincoln-Hoker's help to prepare for this, and I invite anyone in our school community who wants to share their thoughts with me about this important issue to please do so. May I have a motion in a second to approve the minutes of July 23rd, 2024 for the trustee group? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Excellent, as always. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. School spotlight, you want to talk about that? I'd just like to introduce uh, our Spanish teacher, Aaron Mendelson, uh, who's going to give a, a brief update to the board on uh, what we offer in Spanish. So again, Aaron, how many years have you been here? Uh, this is my eighth year here. I started in 2017. Yeah. <clears throat> so when Aaron came here, there was no Spanish program. There was no foreign language program. And, uh, and Aaron's really done amazing work over those eight years, uh, building the curriculum, working with our, our vocational programs, and uh, as you're going to see, talking about bioliteracy, uh, the seal of bioliteracy during this presentation. So uh, I can't thank you enough for your service and the assistance. And I'm sure the students are walking away when they graduate with skills that they never would have thought of you know, 10 years ago. So, Aaron? Okay, thanks. Uh, my name is Aaron Mendelson. Uh, I teach Spanish here at Smith. Um, like uh, Dr. Lincoln Hooker just mentioned, um, I started the program here. So in 2017, um, it was the first year that students at Smith took Spanish on campus here, and we started with Spanish 1. Um, that's still like the main course that most students, um, you know, most of my classes are Spanish 1, at least half of them are Spanish 1. Um, so we have Spanish 1 for 10th grade and 11th grade. Um, we even have some seniors that opt to take um, Spanish 1 with the, uh, with the 10th graders too. Uh, so we have Spanish 1, now we have Spanish 2 at the school as well. Spanish 2 is generally for um, 11th and 12th graders. And uh, we also have Spanish 3. Um, and finally we have Heritage Spanish. Heritage Spanish is a course for uh, students who speak Spanish at home. Um, it's an opportunity for them to continue learning Spanish. Um, and most importantly, uh, it's an opportunity for them to develop their literacy skills in Spanish. Um, so that's kind of like an overview of the courses that we offer here. And um, now I'm going to talk about some of the programs that we've been implementing slowly over the past couple of years. Uh, one of the biggest programs is the Seal of Biliteracy. Um, the Seal of Biliteracy is a state program, and it's, uh, it's run through DESI, and we offer it here at the school. Um, it may seem like it's kind of obvious what it is, but actually, actually I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, <clears throat> the Seal of Biliteracy is a, um, a stamp that goes on a student's diploma once they graduate. So nobody's earning the Seal of Biliteracy until they graduate. Um, and uh, it says that the student is biliterate. That means they can read, write, speak, and um, comprehend um, in two languages uh, at a certain level. So um, that doesn't mean that <clears throat> students are getting this just because they speak Spanish at home. Um, Many students who speak Spanish at home um, still struggle with their literacy skills, and that's one of the points of the, uh, the Heritage Spanish course, is to help them further develop their literacy. Um, we've actually had a number of students who speak Spanish at home who come very close to getting the seal by literacy and don't get it because um, their, their writing ability or their reading ability is almost there but not quite. So, uh, that's one of the um, purposes of the Heritage Spanish course that we have here. Um, I think it's pretty clear, it's pretty evident how this could be beneficial to students. Um, you know, when you kind of when you're going to apply for jobs, it's it's a kind of like the gold standard, showing employers that this this person um, can command two languages instead of 
just saying, you know, I'm, I'm bilingual or something on your resume. Here's like the stamp from the state that says that you are. Um, additionally, it's a, uh, it can be um, similar to like the AP exam where you could get college credits for it. I think UMass is now offering 12 college credits for the CO Biliteracy and, um, and languages. So um, that's significant. Not every college does, but more and more colleges are offering it. Uh, so it can be a real, uh, a real asset to students um, after they leave here. Um, it's really, it's a very prestigious award. And it's not like um, we're handing out a lot of these. And a lot of, and it's the same in schools all over the state. Um, and by the way, the CO by literacy, I think has been adopted by most states in our country now. The, um, the threshold for where you're able to get the seal by literacy varies by state. It's very high in Massachusetts. Um, so uh, how do you get the seal of by literacy? Well, um, students have to score a certain, um, a certain percentage on their MCAS. I forget exactly what it is. Um, they have to score a certain, in, in their uh, English language arts MCAS, they have to uh, meet a certain score and uh, Mike Parks usually is the authority on that. He works with me on, on implementing the seal by literacy. Um, so I don't worry about that part too much. Mike Parks could tell you, I can't. <laughs> but um, as far as the Spanish content, uh, students take a standardized test. Um, and if we could, is that clicker around somewhere? It's right oh. there in front of the clock. Oh, uh, this one right here? What do we got here? Oh, okay. Is that the next one? No, no. it was. I'll be your clicker. Oh, you got it. Okay, all right. Um, so students, uh, students take a, a standardized test called the Apple test. Um, and the students need to reach, uh, I'll just back up for a second here. All classes at Smith Vocational are um, based on profic they're proficiency oriented. So proficiency is like the level that you can um, perform in a language. Okay, uh, most of our students in Spanish 1, they're at this range right here. This is the novice level. Spanish 1 and 2 students are generally in this level right here. Um, Spanish 3 students are kind of pushing towards intermediate a little bit. Um, but a lot of our heritage students or students who speak Spanish at home, they're up here towards the advanced level, certainly with their oral communication skills and their listening skills. Um, but sometimes their reading skills are down here around intermediate, and some of their writing skills as well are down here in intermediate. A lot of these students, um, they've never really had uh, any kind of like formal classes in Spanish before, especially if, they're, um, if they didn't go to school in, in um, their, their place of you know, where their, their parents are from, be it uh, you know, Puerto Rico or Mexico or where, you know, where have you. If they were raised here in this country, they likely haven't had any formal education in Spanish at all. Um, therefore, their, their reading and writing skills um, are kind of like, you know, still around intermediate, even though they might be very proficient oral communicators. Um, and so, uh, the standardized test that students need to take in order to get sealed by literacy is called the Apple test, and they have to score intermediate high in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. We have a lot of students that end up scoring um, intermediate high in um, listening, speaking, reading, but not quite making it in, read, in, uh, in writing. Okay. Um, so that's the Seal by Literacy in a nutshell. And uh, there's another program that we're implementing too called the Bioliteracy Pathways Program. Um, oh, this is another, uh, well, I'll tell you about the Bioliteracy Pathways Program. Um, other students in Spanish 2 and 3 are also taking the same standardized test. Um, not for the purpose of getting the seal of biliteracy, but there, are, there is another system of language credentialing that um, we're able to do here at Smith Vocational, um, whereby students get a certificate that they can put together with their other vocational certificates that say they meet some of these other ranges in, in language acquisition. Okay, um, so. That kind of certificate, although it's not a stamp on their diploma, like the seal by literacy is, it is a certificate that they can show an employer and say, you know what, I'm not like 
fluent in Spanish, but I have I can perform some basic functions in Spanish, and um, I think that's valuable as an employee, you know, as, as a potential employee to your company or or business. So that's another program that we have here. Um, last year, I, don't, I think we had like 20 something students get certificates in the Bioliteracy Pathways program. Um, and you know, once you have a certificate, you could always get the higher one next year if you're in 11th grade. Um, you could always work towards the higher one. And um, you know, I think it's it's not difficult to see how a certificate and language can connect to the vision of a graduate um, and so on. It's uh, you know, we all know that Spanish language skills can be can be valuable um, in a lot of the uh, professions and vocations that we offer. Um, so yeah, we'll just flip to the next slide briefly. This is a um, this is a chart that shows the amount of time that it takes to reach some of these ranges. Uh, so again, to get the seal of biliteracy, that's like up here towards the upper end of the intermediate range. Um, that takes a lot of time to uh, to attain. So that's for somebody who's taken Spanish consistently from like third grade through 12th grade, um, you know, year, year long courses um, for, for several years on end. They have the amount of time necessary to develop that level of proficiency where they could attain sealed by literacy. Um, that's why we don't have, at our school here, we just don't have that time. Um, and so, you know, we don't have dozens of recipients of the seal by literacy here at the school. Um, however, we do have a lot of students that can attain up in, in this range up here. Uh, it's kind of a unique teaching environment for a lot of reasons, but um, as far as, as languages go, students are coming from all kinds of different middle schools. Some have had Spanish before, some haven't had Spanish before, some have had three or four years of Spanish before, and they're sitting next to kids that haven't had Spanish at all. Um, so, you know, in the class, in my Spanish one and two classes, like, we have a large range right in here of abilities, of proficiency levels. Um, and, you know, grades nine through 10, taking Spanish all year long, you might get to like novice high. Um, and we do have a lot of kids attaining that here, um, which you'll see in the next slide. Uh, oh, this is, this is the Bioliteracy Pathways program that I was mentioning. This is for the lower levels, Spanish two and three, are taking the same standardized tests and getting certificates in the Bioliteracy Pathways program. So we've had many of these that we've awarded. Um, this is the novice high level. Now, students need to score novice high on all four um, domains, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. We've had a lot of these. Um, last year we had a lot of these, probably a dozen of these. Um, I don't have the numbers. Probably should have added that in here. Didn't do it. Okay. Um, we have a lot of, we have some intermediate low um, bioliteracy attainment awards last year as well. And I think maybe one or two of these. We had one of these last year. And um, like I mentioned before, we have several students who came very close. They're in 11th grade. They're probably going to take the writing portion again so that they can try to get the seal of life by literacy before they graduate this year. And then um, we just have a couple more slides. This is like some data from that test that I was mentioning, the test that everybody takes the same test, Spanish 2, Spanish 3, Heritage Spanish, they're all taking the same test. Um, this is a traditional classroom. So this is Spanish 1, 2, and 3. Um, the dots represent the national average of all schools in the United States, all students that are taking this test. So this is on um, intermediate, uh, this is um, interpretive listening and speaking, presentational writing, interpretive listening, interpretive reading what these stand for. So we're a little below average um, for all students in the country um, on those levels. This is novice. The N means novice. The I means intermediate. Um, and then the last slide. These are heritage learners. These are students who take Spanish, uh, who speak Spanish at home. Again, the, uh, the yellow dot is the national average for heritage learners. 
So our heritage learners are slightly above average here. However, um, you'll notice for reading, uh, an I-5 is, is the threshold for the seal by literacy in Massachusetts. It's lower in other states. Um, a lot of students are not quite getting I-5s in, in the writing. So that's the main focus of the Heritage Spanish course. That's it. That's, uh, that's Spanish. It's Smith vocational in a nutshell. You guys have any questions? Aaron, I want to thank you very much. That's right. very important to our school, and we support you 100%. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Um, you worked with a colleague in another part of the state um, last year. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, last year, uh, a colleague of mine from another um, vocational school, Michelle Tech, invited me to be part of a grant that she applied for. It was a grant from DESI. Um, the Office of Language Acquisition at DESI offered this grant. Um, and one of the purposes was to have vocational schools collaborate about their language programs. Um, so we had five vocational schools in the collaboration. Um, Smith Vocational, obviously, Neshova Tech, Pathfinder, Essex, um, Shashin, Yeah, so um, the goal was to uh, have some professional development sessions together. We had two of them at a Shashin um, Tech and uh, collaborate on curriculum writing. And um, those are the main things. Was it beneficial? Absolutely, yeah. In yeah. fact, the uh, Bioliteracy Pathways program is something that came out of that work. That we all decided this would be uh, something that, that fit with um, the goals of vocational schools to uh, have something on paper that, that can show that a student yeah. has has met some um, some professional some proficiency goals. Yeah, it's awesome sure. for them to have that credential, yeah. you know, for whatever level they reach. Um, how is the um, speaking test administered? Do you administer it? No, no, um, no. I uh, the um, the Apple test is. Uh, it's offered by a larger organization called the American Council for the Teaching of Foreign Languages. It's like the biggest organization in the country. Everybody defers to them. Desi defers to them. Um, they kind of like help states write their curriculum, their frameworks, and their standards and stuff like that. And this test is designed and administered by that organization. Um, there are raters who are highly trained. Um, I, I have nothing to do with the grading on the test. Gotcha. Yeah. So how are the students demonstrating their speaking ability? Is it like yeah. talking to a headset? Yeah, it is. It is. Back? And okay. you know, and therefore, you know, it's fair to say that it's somewhat artificial and um, But still it's they're not using AI to No, no, no. Yeah. The the um, the, the program it's all on a computer. The whole test is on a computer. Gotcha. Um, and it's it's designed so that it can't let, you know, no other pop-up windows can come up or anything like right. that. Yeah. It'll shut down yeah. um, and, you know, it'll alert the system. The student, student was trying to use another window or some, you know. Um, so, yeah, the whole thing's on the computer. You can only have one window open. It's a test, some, like similar to MCAS, right. you know. Yeah. Um, and so, um, they're, yeah, the raters who, who listen to the, the samples that are produced are, are, are highly trained. So. I, think, I think maybe I can help. The prompts, they're prompted to respond to things. Yes. And that's how they're getting tested on the, the speaking. Yeah, so they'll, they'll listen to a prompt, like, um, and you know, they can be, they can be somewhat advanced. Like, um, tell me about some community service projects and their in your community, you know, in your neighborhood. Um, and students will be um, expected to respond. Now, I, you know, that, that actually is an example of a question that was on the test. And, um, you know, I, I found it to be a little bit like, well, you know, maybe people are unaware of community <laughs> service projects in their neighborhood. So it's not, you know, that's not a very good um, measure of their proficiency in Spanish if they're just you know, unaware of project. The content knowledge. Yeah, yeah, content. their background knowledge might yeah. not all, uh, be there, but um, the challenge yeah. assessments. A lot of the questions were good. 
there's some basic ones. Tell me about the weather today. Um, to, uh, describe describe your neighborhood. Is it what's it like? Um, you know, what do you wear to school every day? Um, and uh, your students have very short time to respond. Yeah. Very little processing time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. All right, next item on the agenda, we have a guest with us this evening. Uh, Tom is here from National Grid. Uh, We're doing some work here at the school that it's a proposed National Grid grant update program for redoing the lighting inside of the school. And Tom, if you would stay up and introduce yourself. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, well, trustees, I'm Tom Kerr, National Grid. I'm an EE specialist at National Grid, working with for five years. Uh, helping our customers and clients uh, throughout the state here upgrade uh, their facilities and reduce their electricity costs by retrofitting lighting and uh, changing the way that they use electricity in their municipal buildings, schools, and uh, whatnot. Uh, we have a program uh, through MassAid that allows us to uh, bring in general contractors to spec out a replacement of uh, lighting technology in your school as well as other technology that could help reduce your energy costs substantially. And we will fund those projects uh, uh, substantially within the, uh, the organization so that uh, you, can, you can actually take part in uh, engineering those, uh, or implementing that, that technology for the energy savings that, that occur. We had a general contractor come in uh, by the name of uh, Commonwealth Electrical Technologies. They're a well-known uh, PEX of ours. We call them Project Expediters, PEX for short. Uh, they're general contractors that do lighting, heat pumps, uh, all, of, all things electric, uh, and help us implement them in a uh, participate in the program. The way the program works is uh, they will inspect the lighting that's necessary for this particular facility, replace the high wattage with low wattage uh, technology, uh, LED technology, um, and um, they'll install that for you, and we'll pay them for the projects. There is some out-of-pocket for the entity, the schools, uh, and uh, we also have a program that allows uh, us to uh, help fund that particular portion using on-bill repayment. On-bill repayment is a uh, function of having a uh, certain amount on the bill for uh, a certain period of time that uh, you pay every month for that out-of-pocket expense. Right now we're running a program that allows us to whatever is proposed by the project expediter for the work to be done, uh, we will pay up to 50% of that in incentive payments. That's basically a grant from National Grid and the rest can be put on bill for a certain period of time. Ben and I worked on uh, understanding what the payback and what the savings would be, and whether or not it would be cash neutral if we put the low wattage equipment in, uh, whether or not your electricity bill will substantially reduce enough to cover the costs that, uh, of the ongoing repayment, and we've made it cash neutral in this, in this respect. So we have two proposals here, one for uh, general lighting, replacement of voluntary lighting uh, within, uh, within the campus here, uh, and uh, that has both on-bill and incentive uh, portions or components to it. And then we also have a portion uh, that uh, will take advantage of uh, uh, controlling your fans and motors that uh, help uh, keep and cool your facility here, uh, called VFDs, and that's another part of the program that's funded in the same way. 50% of the cost of the uh, total implementation is covered by National Grid, and the rest is on the payment. Any questions? You Ben? I'm Ben, yes. I'm Andy Lincoln over there. Nice Hi, to meet you. Nice to meet you. Emails. Uh, ben, do you want to, to explain from the city side uh, you know, the agreement that we have? So at the end of the day, what the cost will elect thereof uh, for the school? Do you want to explain yeah, that? Yeah, so, um, so, so I'm, I'm Ben Wall, for those who haven't met me, uh, new Director of Climate Action and Project Administration. Um, so the key thing is that the two projects that we're talking about are lighting projects and variable frequency drive projects. Of all the energy efficiency types of projects, these are the most predictable. In other words, it, it, 
what the utility says you're going to get in your payback is actually probably really, really close to true, except for the variable frequency drives, because I happen to know stuff about how things are controlled now, so our savings will actually be a lot larger than the utilities predict. So consider that a conservative estimate. What I, so the first half is that they're paying half of the cost, so 50% already, and this is a one-time deal that will end, because essentially a lot of these types of incentives may start to be phased out by national grid. So they're trying to get these before the end of the year. So that's the first part of it. The second part of it is that the on-bill repayment, I've structured it so that it's actually over a longer period of time. It's a 0% loan is what it is from the national grid. So I've structured it so it takes a longer period of time than your payback period, meaning that your cash flow positive on in, in your first bill. But then we're sweetening it a little bit <laughs> because we discovered some credits that are on other city bills that are for small bills that we're not able to use those credits. They, they're just kind of accumulating credits over time. So we're going to take those and we have a one-time opportunity to transfer those to other bills. So we're going to transfer some to the smith Boak bill, some to a Forbes bill. Um, but yeah, those are the two those are the two projects. Um, so what you will see, or whoever <laughs> pays your bills will see on the bill, is when we finally put that credit on, you'll see kind of a, a, a and probably a negative balance. Um, but then you'll you'll see an amount that if you simply request over in the case of the lighting three years and in the case of the BFD five years, um, if you request essentially the same energy uh, um, operating uh, uh, fun funding that you always request, you're paying the utility in both cases, it's just you're paying them for the service rather than for the electricity. There's another savings that's, that's in both of these that is not reflected in the estimate. And tell me if I'm wrong, but this, my impression was that if this is an energy estimate, not a power estimate. And because Smith Voke has a, uh, some very high power demands, you end up paying a fairly large amount in demand charges, which is the, the kind of the, the, the highest 15 minutes in any month sets your price for the whole uh, for the whole month. So by taking all of this base load, all this stuff that's kind of just always there and just dropping it, we drop our peak demand. Then we take our VFDs, when those, that, when all of those fan motors start up in the morning, right, and you're just like starting up the whole building, you do that, you turn on the lights, and then maybe you start running the kitchen, <laughs> and boom, you've just set yourself your new uh, peak demand for that month, which is high, and I think it's something like $9 per kilowatt, something like that. That adds up, adds up a lot. So. Uh, before I had this job, I worked at UMass, and we actually analyzed uh, the Smithville campus, and we saw that demand charges were a really big portion of the energy bill, and we kind of worked incrementally to figure out how could we drop it. And variable frequency drives were a big tool for ramping up fans kind of one at a time and getting them up to the right speed, and actually, they've been oversized. So we can kind of permanently turn them down to about 75%. And the fan laws, the fan affinity laws, basically say that your power, that the change in speed, you actually get the cube of that proportionally in terms of a reduction in energy. So a cube reduction is very large. So you reduce your power in your speed by, let's say, 80%. You're now getting savings of greater than 50 percent in on those moments. So all of that comes together to say that I think we're actually getting bigger savings than what we've estimated to try to get get all these projects. And the key thing is to get the projects done before Christmas. <laughs> this is so awesome. Our energy bills are. I mean, they're so big, and to bring them down would be awesome. I had um, Mass Ave come to my house not too long ago, and so when I read this report beforehand, I was like, that looks a lot like what was done for my house, but on a much bigger scale. Who, like, did someone count every single one of these lights? Yeah, so someone came in and actually did an audit 
in all of like seven buildings. Looking at the technology that was in there now, those are T8s, uh, 32 watts a piece, and they okay. counted and did the wattage usage okay. and the hours of use and calculated all that for us. They're trained to do that okay. um, so that they can apply accurately to us so that we can calculate and send that. The promo program that Ben just mentioned, which is the, <coughs> the uh, total incentive cost, is a new program that we just launched in August um, to help us meet our goals that are we're responsible for the Department of uh, Energy Resources. We need commitments to them and PPE that we're going to help our customers save so much. Nice. And uh, we're a little behind on the electric side, so uh, we, we uh, bump the product, uh, program up to 50%. So, so we'll help you meet your goal. Well, will help national yeah. I, don't know, oh, I don't know if you can answer this, but in the um, culinary arts shop, uh, there are beautiful new lights, like they're flat. Mm -hmm. no. We're not touching those. And know, similar, we see lights like that in. That's a separate in-house project. Gotcha. So yeah, the, there is that detail, um, yep. which is I think in this room and the hallways. Yep. Uh, Tim Smith acquired partly through a national grid program. Right. I think seventy or hundred and seventy. I can't remember. A lot. Number, yeah. A lot of. I think there were hundred and ten. hundred and ten. Okay. Yes. Some number like that. <laughs> he acquired a bunch of them. They're sitting there. His plan is to have students install them as part of the education. So the, those portions are carved off. We're not touching them. The incentive for the acquisition has already been done. Um, so obviously, if Tim can get that done, then you can save it. Right, and just to piggyback that, I wanted that to be clear. Um, but also this proposal isn't technically for all the buildings. So as one example, D building is not part of the proposal, a few others. But long term, as Dr. Tim, we do envision gradually whatever is done, not done through this project, our goal is to complete the campus. So which buildings are part of this? A, B, C, <coughs> It's A, B, and C. And if you think about what you have left, D, I, I think our general impression is let's not invest in D if we can possibly help it. Um, and then you've got a bunch of new buildings that are going to be up to uh, up to code, and, and you know there won't be anything to do. And why not D? Because anything we do with D is going to be sometime down the road. We are we are going to do D. We're going to do D separately. In house, possibly with okay. So for for next steps, uh, all we need is a signature uh, from. Uh, Crystal, or for you, you all to uh, push this forward and, and start the work. Um, what that does is it'll activate the project expediter to schedule the work that's necessary, order the equipment that's going to be done, and then consult with Tim and uh, uh, on time to be out here. Uh, I believe that the, uh, the work is going to be done after school hours, and it's coded that way as well. So that uh, there's no interference with the students. And, Could we have staff coverage during that time anyways? We're not we'll coordinate paying that. overtime type of charges. Yeah, that'll be coordinated with Tim and his people. I just want to thank Director Weil so much for he's really been investing a lot of time trying to figure this out. And of course, Grid, thank you as well for, for this. I, I know it's been a focus of them for a long time to figure out how to get you guys. Well, if, you're, path. if you're studying at UMass, how nice to see this come to fruition here, now. Well, this is a teeny tiny part of our study. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, eventually, we've got a whole lot of other stuff to do, um, which includes, you know, thinking about, you know, and I'll preview it, like, if the, if the plan is to get to zero carbon, and we have to electrify, and we have to electrify at high efficiency, those steam boilers over there are massively, massively outsized. And this plan that I developed, I shared with Tim, but I don't know who else we, we sh he shared it with, is a progressive plan to kind of progressively uh, electrify all the buildings, probably with a ground source or using the wastewater resource that's kind of going right by in that field there um, as heat exchange. Um, and my impression in terms of how we planned it was that building D would be replaced. 
and that that would be part of his overall. Um, just to kind of preview what we're thinking about. We're on notice. Yeah. <laughs> so we have fun things that you're advocating, and I think keep the mayor for even allowing the critics to come to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to, at this point, we've moved it up the agenda. They have a motion to second to approve the proposed National Grid Grants Update Program. So moved. Second. Oh. Dr. Bonner. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Relatively short per, uh, presentation this evening. Just a few highlights. So at the summer avenue retreat, you know, we went through and sort of uh, tried to, to line up the various school spotlights. And, and again, thank you to Aaron uh, for batting lead off and, and presenting this evening at the September meeting. And just to preview the following months uh, for the board, uh, you can you can expect until Ed uh, in October, health assisting in November, math in December, cosmetology in January. Athletics and Co-op in February, Phys Ed in March, Cabinet Making in April, Skills USA in May, and finally FFA in June. So those are the spotlights and also the changes. The management and operations, uh, and, and I want to just again introduce Craig, uh, the OPM the Horticulture Project. He is sitting in the, in the peanut gallery, uh, and, and he's going to be prepared to talk under the committee's report uh, probably in more in-depth uh, around the horticulture project. And just a couple from my level, high level uh, updates around the horticulture building. Uh, the excavation work uh, has started, finally. Uh, we had some issues around some unsuitable soil, uh, which uh, I'm sure Craig can go into more detail or direct. But uh, in essence, what happened was uh, when construction began and they started to excavate the site, uh, we found a lot of unsuitable soil. Uh, there was some fly ash that was found, uh, and then we had a lot of discussion and debate how do we mitigate that? Again, the challenge is if you have bad dirt and you try to build a very nice building on bad dirt, what's going to happen to that nice building in 20, 30, 40, 50 years? So that was sort of the discussion, how do we mitigate that? On top of uh, the potential bad dirt, there's also objects in the bad dirt that we had to deal with. Uh, well before most of our time, uh, perhaps Mr. Kalian's time as a former student, you know, there was a building at one point back there that in essence was buried, and uh, we found a lot of the old objects that we had to deal with. So, uh, God's a lot of gray hair uh, amongst a lot of us, but we finally got beyond that phase, and uh, uh, concrete trucks will begin to arrive to set form the, uh, the foundation, hopefully this week. And then finally, un unfortunately, because of that delay, uh, we are probably going to be talking about winter conditions uh, and potential uh, delay when it comes to June, July. So, I don't want to spill all the beans, I'll allow Craig to sort of outline some of that. Anyways, we'll get there. We are seeing progress. But um, I'd like to jump in on that of project completion delay. And I don't know for sure, but off the top of my head, this being a school project, I would hope there's wording in the documents about um, going beyond the scheduled substantial completion date. I know I ran up this, into this quite a number of times in my building career that you had to get the job done on date. Okay, um, regardless of these little things. Some of these little things um, in today's meeting, Mr. Kider talked about additional days, and I know he's trying to protect his interest in that. But the, and I'm thinking in myself, going like, okay, um, I understand where you're coming from, but you still do have a goal to meet. And some of these incidental things or some of these things I think are incidental in my mind aren't a big deal and can be rolled into the regular schedule and mitigated by increased manpower, not additionally overtime, uh, ramping up uh, how things get done. And maybe, Craig, you can touch on that during your Yeah, I know. Fair point, sir. I think those topics could address. We had a, a meeting before the meeting today and a lot of the topics were addressed on you know, what is already in the project and, and what is sort of the uh, silence of the delta, you know, the 
difference between the executables that uh, that'll be added onto the schedule. So Greg, I'm sure you can talk about that. Uh, moving on to the companion animal building, uh, some good news finally after you know, several years of uh, discussion and vision and planning and design. Uh, this past Friday, uh, we received a uh, uh, passing grade on all the final inspections, uh, which meant as of yesterday, we had access for our students. Uh, we were able to get into the building, begin moving in, and uh, you know, hopefully before we know it, we'll have some teaching and learning occurring that particular building. Uh, which brings me to the next topic. I know over the summer at the last board meeting, we talked about a potential open house, uh, sort of a ceremony to kick off that. I'd love to... Uh, get some input from the board as far as preferences around uh, some type of open house ceremony for the board, the community, just to, to showcase this new board. So. Definitely agree with that. We can uh, make sure we can have some good okay. You want to throw some out now? I'd recommend during the school day. You know, I'd yeah. probably recommend Tuesdays. It seems like Tuesdays are... Yeah, yeah. So, there's a Tuesday during the school day that works for the board. In which September, October? We'll probably look at October. 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 We have October 1st. We have October 8th. Just to allow the, some marketing to get the word out. Yeah. 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 And what time of day? During the school day, like, I'm open to time. I'd say probably after nine o'clock. Yeah, good for me. Nine o'clock. Uh, we have a construction meeting at ten o'clock on Tuesdays. So I'd say before ten or after eleven. October what? Eight. Eight. Eleven. 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 Yes, for the Thank you. And um, will we, have we identified who we want to invite you to come already before we will do it? I'm thinking of the local events especially. Not, not veterans, but um, veteran events. And I would invite the Good Dog Squad. They helped. And and the political dignitaries, you know, yeah, I'm Lindsay Joe, you yeah. know, all those yeah. sort of people. Yeah. The folks who will um, potentially partner yeah. with our yeah. students on co-op. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Employee that would be so happy that we have the training exactly. folks to work with. Okay. Another update uh, from my level. Uh, Proud to say, happy to say that the building sidewalk project has been completed. We received a lot of positive feedback. It, it really looks wonderful when we around. Uh, so that was great. And, and thank the city. Uh, that was part of the capital improvement projects uh, that were funded. So uh, thank you. <clears throat> Looking at this school year, uh, and this is to, I want to thank Tim uh, and his crew. There's been a lot of major projects on campus over the last several years. I think so a lot of things we've done. Really, th this year's focus is not necessarily new projects, uh, but we really want to sort of hammer down and, and nail down uh, unfinished projects. Uh, so we sort of have a punch list that we've developed. Uh, we're, we're reviewing that every leadership meeting. And our goal this year is uh, really not new projects, but let's wrap them up so we can check them off the box. Uh, so that's really going to be the focus this year. I do want to welcome Caitlin Lucier. Uh, she is uh, our new superintendent and administrative assistant. Uh, started last Monday, and as of yesterday, I believe it was, uh, is our new Board of Trustee Clerk. Uh, so Caitlin will be sitting in Dev seat uh, in October. Welcome. Welcome, Caitlin. 
And lastly, under management and operations, we had our, our annual fall fire drill. Uh, we had some feedback from the fire department that we'll be uh, working on to, to make, the, make, make sure things are, are safe and more efficient. And, uh, thank you to the fire department for doing that. Next slide, just some, some photos. And again, you'll see this during the open house. Uh, but that middle photo, I know it's very difficult to see uh, here. Uh, the middle photo is the construction site for the horticulture building. Uh, down back, kind of looking towards up towards the football field. Uh, we're ready for concrete. Okay, but uh, not a whole lot to look at at this moment. In all the photos around the perimeter of this slide, are all photos of the green handle. Uh, so, uh, in no particular order, uh, just on, this, on the screen or on the slide in front of you, the upper left hand corner is sort of our back utility room. Uh, we have a washer and dryer, so we can. Make sure all the, the towels and whatnot are clean. Uh, that's where the restrooms are. The upper center photo uh, is in the related classroom. Uh, it's sort of this hybrid use, uh, mixed use. It would be the related classroom is also going to be the intake uh, space, the retail space of uh, as staff bring the dogs in for the day. Uh, that would be sort of the check-in, drop-off area. Uh, and then uh, eventually we'll have some display cases where we can sell some uh, shampoos and leashes and whatnot to help generate some revenue. The upper right hand corner, uh, that is the, the kennel room. Uh, so obviously we're not set up yet, but that's where all the dog and the cat kennels will be uh, set up. The lower left hand corner, I think this is one of the highlights of the project. Uh, this is the outdoor run area. Uh, so I want to thank, again, uh, Tim and his crew. They built a beautiful retaining wall uh, to bring this up to grade. And uh, what you see there is an artificial turf, uh, which is approved for dog use. So the idea is the dogs can go out there, I believe some energy, relieve themselves, uh, and then go back inside and get cleaned and then it can be counted. Uh, so it's a beautiful, beautiful area. The lower center photo uh, is the, uh, the, the grooming area. Again, beautiful area. You see that the large windows there, brings in a lot of natural light. Uh, those tables there are the, the grooming tables. And in the picture in the lower right hand corner is sort of an extension of that uh, the grooming area, and that's the wash. You can see the, the wash bins there, uh, the dogs and cats. I doubt the cats, but the dogs will be, will be clean. Uh, so, uh, again, I want to thank everybody who's been involved, uh, the students that were involved, plumbing and electrical, uh, Tim and his crew, a few outside contractors. It really is a beautiful space. We had a lot of instructors from other shops uh, walk through there, and they were just blown away. And I really do think this is going to be a draw when it comes to uh, student recruitment student choice, uh, when they see this, it's air conditioned, okay, so you can imagine a lot of students may want to choose this particular program or whatever, so, job well done. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, who, I drove by earlier today, it's a to see it for myself after having seen the pictures mm -hmm. in your report. Um, who designed? It was an architecture firm. Um, okay, so it, we, we it was a professional. Yes. Yes. So the placement of that large window. Then the retraining, retaining hall is absolutely gorgeous. Our horticulture students didn't do that. Is that because it was over the summer? Correct. Yeah. 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 And um, the outdoor area also so impressive. Um, and because PFAS are in the news a lot, and certainly with the other most you've seen the cameras, that they've just been working around with around about artificial turf versus. Um, so I'm curious when you say it's approved, and thinking about animals, systems, um, they're smaller animals and so they might get overwhelmed by toxins more. Um, so just curious about the research process in choosing that and vetting it for the safety of the animals and our students. Right. The key when it came to uh, approval for the animals uh, was more of the waste. Uh, so when the dogs do the business, what's the drainage uh, capability? Uh, so obviously the solids we'll have to clean up, but uh, the urine will Filtered out and what kinds of things you should have. So that was our biggest concern. Right, and the forever chemicals yes. that are in it. Yep. It, it comes from a specific company that manufactures this for this purpose. So it's for, it's for pets and animals. So yeah. We're not planning on putting this on the football field. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to, but. Okay. It, it makes a lot of sense, and that comes at a cost. Family and community engagement. Uh, <coughs> um, excuse me. Of course. Why don't you elaborate more about the design? We originally had 
of a set of plans, and then Tim cross paths with the eventual designer. How that all come together again? Uh, prior to the pandemic, <coughs> we had a vision of a companion of building in a different location. And, and a different architect. I believe it was the same place, like T squared, I think. No, oh, well, wasn't Roy Brown originally involved in the initial concept? What, uh, Roy Brown has been used on other projects on, on campus. I think there's some connected <coughs> with, with Roy Brown, but uh, I forget how, honestly, how Tim got connected with the okay. But yes, Brown has been used elsewhere. Um, all right, what, what I'm remembering is somewhere along the line, some Tim came in contact with this group, um, like what he had to say. They talked more. They've done more. They had done similar facility, and and um, almost similar to how we shifted gear from our feasibility to study to how we ended up with SMN. And so it was it was a well thought process. Family and community engagement. Uh, we had our new student orientation on Friday the 23rd. Uh, we see new students, typically mostly our, our freshmen, but we do have some sophomores and juniors who come here uh, for the first time and welcome uh, for that event. I want to thank Mr. Bianca and his team. Uh, did a great job in gymnasium that morning with various presentations. We got the students out on tours uh, and then hopefully inform the parents and family members of what to expect on day one. Uh, that weekend uh, was coming to fair uh, that was staffed by the administrative team again a lot of great uh, outreach unlike the three county fair which was the following weekend labor day weekend uh, the coming to fair we find that there's a great opportunity for us to reach out to current <coughs> student body and family members but also alumni we have a lot of, of alumni that come by and say hi and, uh, and uh, i graduated from school in 1950 and you know they just reminisce uh, which is great you know outreach uh, to the community uh, as Dr. Spencer Robinson said, the, the Three County Fair over Labor Day weekend, a great event. I think the barn was great. Uh, just, you know, the setup was honestly really well done. So I want to thank all the students and staff that were involved with that. Last week, uh, on September 12th, we had a back to school night. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with back to school night, that's what most districts call open house. Uh, that's where family members can come in and meet the uh, teachers, give the teachers an opportunity to talk about uh, learning outcomes and, and goals for the year. Uh, a quick introduction, really not teacher-parent conferences, it's more of just a quick intro. Uh, the families are able to follow the child's schedule that, that evening. And then uh, earlier today, I had the opportunity, uh, thank you Mr. Bianca and Sherry for joining me. Uh, we hosted a, a dialogue and tour uh, Pathfinder, Quayvon, and Plaza. So Pathfinder is a, a regional vocational school down in Palmer, and uh, they have about eight or nine different member districts. So typically eastern Hamden County, sort of into uh, western Worcester County, so their catchment area. Uh, and Quayabog and Quad are two traditional regional school districts, uh, sort of in that the Barry Brookfield area, okay, so in Worcester County. And the challenge that they're having, to keep this sort of the Cliff Notes version, uh, there's an opportunity uh, with some available space in one of the communities. Uh, as you can imagine, these small communities, student enrollment is going down, so the space is not becoming available. And uh, the challenge that they're, they're giving to Pathfinder is we want more offerings, uh, vocational offerings. And the push is animal science, to be honest. Uh, so Pathfinder reached out uh, and, and asked me some questions. I said, let's come on up and you know, we'll do a tour of animal science and we'll talk about the scope and, and expands in that particular program, and it was a wonderful opportunity, in my opinion, to have the three superintendents uh, come, and uh, thank you to Joe and Melanie at the event in the conference room. Uh, step one was to show them the amount of acreage that we have. Uh, so I pulled up Google Maps, I showed them uh, not only the land that we have here, the pasture land, but we also talked about the state lands and all the acreage up there. That if they truly want to have an animal science program, and if you're going to have cows and horses and goats and pigs and so on and so forth, it takes a lot of space. Uh, and that's something that I'm not quite sure they were really talking about. Uh, and then after that, we, you know, we had a discussion around curriculum, and then we toured the facilities down back, and you know, the true scale of you know, what a, a working farm entails uh, was quite a bit. Uh, we talked about some alternatives uh, that DESE has allowed over the last several years. Uh, a lot of traditional regional vote techs, they've created vet assisting programs, and uh, perhaps that's one area that they may want to pursue. And that seems to be uh, to the like. So, 
we'll see what happens. Uh, but that is happening. Statewide, the competition is there. Uh, these communities are trying to find ways to, make, to, to retain their students in the home districts uh, because it costs a lot of money. Uh, so this is why you know, we've been pushing hard over the last several years to expand our animal science offerings. Uh, and this is case in point. Uh, and it just, I, I feel, uh, reaffirms uh, the need for us to continue to animal science and get the concentrations that we need, i.e. the animal building, that was step one. Uh, equine, you're going to hear from me you know, moving forward that we need to have a larger equine presence here. Uh, because as long as we're offering animal science the way animal science should be offered, it's in the regulations that students have the right to cover. Even when, if and when Pathfinder offers a vet assisting program, if a student in that district wants animal science, they can still come. I told that to the three superintendents. Uh, so it's very, very important that we continue moving in the direction. So. And not just to address student declining student enrollment, but to um, meet student interest and industry demand. Yeah, and that's it's interesting. I was talking to Mr. Bianca afterwards, you know, and there is a clear difference between student interest and industry need. Yeah, uh, a mismatch. There is a yeah. big mismatch at that. We can look at the college level. You know, a great example, of Mr. Bianca, you know, shared with me earlier. You know, how many, how many college students graduate from college with a particular degree that you can't get a job, uh, and that's unfortunate for that, that college grad. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a vocational school, our goal is to support the job market, and the job market in Western Mass might be different than the job market in Eastern Mass. And uh, you know, it's unfortunate that schools are able to create programs for student interest uh, that then doesn't meet, meet the job market. And on top of that, uh, it's unfortunate that the state may approve programs because they want to say yes to students. Philosophically, I can understand that. But then when it comes to funding <coughs> of the programs, i.e. Perkins and the Skills Capital Grant, in order for us to justify the funds for Skills Capital Grant and Perkins, we have to tie it back to our regional blueprint from Mass Hire. So again, if we're trying to support a program that is not in need in that particular area, we're not going to get the Skills Capital Grant money to support that particular program. So why have a program that we can't sustain financially? So, Are we getting any students from these three districts due to our So Pathfinder, again, is the, the vocational school. They have a lot of, a lot of community. But yes, we do have students. Uh, I'm not going to mention another district, um, but it's a district that belongs to Pathfinder. And we have several students from that particular town. And I know that particular town is a strong support of some type of animal science offer. I think right now we have seven students from that particular town here for animal science. So seven students at $20,000 a year plus transportation, yeah. you know, that's right. substantial for one month. So that's the, the pressure that Pathfinder is getting. Right. <clears throat> Quaylog and Quab and Smaller, you know, the challenge for those two you know, school districts and any child living in, in any of those towns to get to Smith is a challenge because we have to plug in the way. Uh, so you'd be talking about a bus ride well over an hour to come here. Um, those students, only other opportunity, if they don't, if they don't want to come west to, to Smith, they have to go east uh, to Norfolk or Essex or Bristol, and that's even a longer bus ride. So uh, it is a challenge for statewide when it comes to animal science. Professional culture, uh, we talked about this over the summer, but the, the theme this year, to be salty, I shared the video, I uh, followed you. Uh, and again, it's how can we motivate our staff, how can we motivate our students to really want to learn and be engaged? Uh, so, you know, always keeping that in mind. And then, uh, sort of with that mindset, one of my goals, uh, not necessarily a professional goal for evaluation, but just for my own well-being, uh, I want to have a, an agreement, I, mean, we talked to, I talked to the administrative team over the summer, well, I want the opportunity to shadow each of them. Uh, you know, I've been an assistant principal, I've been a principal, um, but I've never been the director of pupil services, I've never been a facilities director, I've never been an IT director, and uh, I just want the opportunity to shadow them. Not evaluate, but just to learn what they do day in and day out. Uh, I feel I'll be a better superintendent if I do myself. So that's one of my goals. And saying a good example, it's great for teachers to shadow students as well. Mm -hmm. Donations, uh, this was a, a good month when it comes to donations. Yeah. So I want to thank Arco for donating a cutaway rear axle model for, to automotive. <coughs> Orchard Electric donated a uh, 
an electric powered pressure washer, along with some various accessories for the pressure washer to animal science uh, to assist in the cleaning of animal housing. RK Miles donated various tools, including a, a jigsaw, a multi tool, a sliding compound measure saw, and a saw stand for the saw uh, to carpentry for various projects for the students. And lastly, John Sikowski donated uh, some high quality build your own frames in the art department. So when students uh, create their, their art pieces, they can then build their own uh, frame and have a display. So thank you to, to all of the donations. So we kicked off the meeting uh, talking about you know, this day. In, you know, uh, more than 23 years ago, uh, we're talking 200 years ago. The second bullet there, kind of hard to read, but I'll, I'll try to read it here. Uh, the 15 gentlemen nominated as electors of president and vice president by a Democratic caucus held in Boston in June, la uh, June last have agreed to serve, if elected, Oliver Smith Esquire, who was nominated for Franklin District. Uh, for those who may not know who Oliver Smith is, uh, he was the founder of Smith Foundation. So, a few moons ago, 200 years ago. <laughs> Looking ahead, uh, so again, uh, along with Craig, every Tuesday morning, our weekly construction meetings. Don't forget me. He is from Quadro, uh, virtually. He's on the, the large screen. Uh, so we meet Tuesday mornings. There's various leadership meetings and, and faculty level meetings that we have throughout the month. Uh, tomorrow morning, you'll see it on the agenda. Tomorrow morning is our, our first general advisory meeting, 7 o'clock in the, the cafeteria. Um, next week, I think it's next week. Uh, I have an MIA TMC meeting, that's the Tournament Management Committee meeting down in Franklin. Early October, uh, we have our first Mass High workforce, workforce Board meeting. The following week, I believe we'll have a City Department Head meeting. That Monday is Indigenous People's Day. Uh, that will be the school, the campus itself will be closed. And then the following day on Tuesday, October 15th, we have the next board meeting. With that, I'll turn it back to the Chair. This time we've uh, report from Joe Bale. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Dom Sanchez, our student, current student rep, could not be here. Uh, he participates in uh, fall basketball and they have scrimmages this evening. <clears throat> so we're hopefully he's going to get there. One of our, our other rep, Phoebe Perez, um, uh, did move out of district, so we'll be looking for a replacement there. Um, we want to thank her for her service. Our enrollment this year, currently we're at 588. You can see the, the numbers uh, broke down by grade level. Just highlight the Northampton, that's the highest percentage since I've been here. Um, 140 Northampton students from 9 to 12, 20, almost 24%. Uh, ninth grade, if you look, we're almost at, we're at about 27%, so pretty close to one third of the students in the ninth grade are from Northampton. So that's 40 out of 150. Very high this year. Uh, I think that's what pushed up the overall numbers. And that, that might be a record. I'm not sure. It's, it's definitely the highest since I've been here. Yeah, I, I mean, I've looked at the data back to 1970, and that's not the highest. It's right up there for sure. Because mm -hmm. it's covered by around 18, 19, 20 percent. Yeah, 18, 20. Yeah. Very high. Really um, interesting. Yeah, it was surprising to me when I, when I ran the numbers yeah. and saw it. Uh, New student orientation, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, oh. you looked at me with that look, so I said, that's right. Because that means Northampton was watching. Student, middle school students are choosing Smith Homes and oh, NHS. Yeah, I was watching those numbers during the, <laughs> during the budget season, and I made the point of saying that this is the number, and I was correct to say, no, 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 they'll be going. No, 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 this is the number. Mm -hmm. Looking at the applications that came in, so I'm not They surprised. were quite high. This is also a national trip. It is. It, it is. It is. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, part of it obviously is a backlash to several things that are happening nationally. So, you know, obviously the college crisis and the, the, the college loan crisis that's happening. Um, I think just the parents, parents are always forward looking, right? If you look at artificial intelligence, you look at outsourcing that's happened, you look at, uh, you know, you're, you're going to want to have those conversations with your with children <laughs> to point them to jobs that are least likely to be impacted. So, Interesting. Um, <coughs> so I, I do think that's they're making educated decisions there around the future. Does the middle school survey their students at all about why they made the choice they did? 
I would have asked the guidance counselor. I'd be curious to see, you know, how much it is. Uh, new student orientation, Dr. Lincoln Hubbard uh, started to talk about that. That went very well. Uh, I want to thank Emily Dumas, uh, who's our department head history, and also the National Honor Society advisor. We had 16 NHS students that came and participated in helping with tours with students and parents. That was that was great. It's always good because they start to take over the tours, um, and, and the students and parents have a lot of questions for them. Uh, and I thank Heather Bully. Last year I, I gave her a challenge. We, we kept doing pizza and salad, and I said, I think you got to got to take it up a notch on that day. So she she uh, brought out the walking tacos with the Doritos bags and the and the taco mix, and that was a huge were huge they, success. Were they delicious? They were good. They were good. It was good. Uh, it's team building day that happened on Thursday the 29th. That's our annual team building program that we developed in house. Uh, that was led by Jackie Dugan and our assistant principal Tony Sabonis. One of the adjustments that we made this year is the, uh, the two assistant principals, they are cycling with their students, right? So that means when the graduating class, so this in this case, uh, Tony Sabonis, he came back and picked up the ninth grade, so now he has ninth and eleven. So next year, when the senior, after the seniors graduate, Josh Clark will cycle back and pick up the ninth grade. So we're trying to insert them into that team building day so that the ninth grade students see them and have that connection back. So they're helping plan it uh, and, and do all that. Also want to thank Louis Bonilla and Nate Bergeron who assist with sort of the overall uh, coordination of it during the day. Uh, feedback from the students is overwhelmingly positive. I send out a, uh, after that, they, their sixth period class after they're in it, um, we encourage them to go on and do a survey that gets sent out so that we get their capture their feedback right away. Uh, and some of the English teachers actually have writing assignments based on it and uh, they were able to share some of the thoughts and, and insights with me. So Tony and Jackie will look at that information and then they'll make some adjustments in the programming you know, year over year. Back to school night, <clears throat> that was on September 12th. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we did have Mr. Parks, uh, the Director of Academics. Mike was doing a Title I presentation in the library. Uh, on top of that, we also had our extracurricular clubs out for display in the main hallway. The PTO was here, and this year we had uh, um, Kylie Mercedes, who is here as part of Hilltown Community Health Care, so she was here uh, with a table providing information to parents. Um, our PLCs, just so you, our professional development this year, uh, we're going to be focused around PLC groups, so we're going to be kind of going back to things, some of the things we did pre-pandemic. Uh, and that was really around peer-to-peer -peer investigation and instruction. So uh, last year, uh, we have Mike Parks, who oversees uh, the Professional Development Committee with me. He uh, puts out a survey, we survey all the staff, gets those results back, and we uh, make a determination as to which uh, had the highest interest, what areas and topics, and then uh, we hire facilitators, teacher facilitators, to run those groups. Um, and they really become self-directed work groups. Uh, at the end, they're all expected to create a product or a presentation so that we can cross-load knowledge. Uh, this year, some of the feedback, and uh, I want to thank Mike, his, his leadership. Uh, we're going to do it slightly differently. We usually do like a gallery walk or a presentation. Uh, gallery walk is where they're putting up artifacts or information about it, and everybody sort of walks around like you're at an art gallery, and then they kind of explain it, uh, or they do presentations at faculty meetings. But this year, we're going to break it out so one of the things that we, we saw was you really had the two facilitators who overwhelmingly became experts in that topic and then they presented to everybody. So the goal is to have all 12 members or so of that group to uh, sort of uh, almost like a jigsaw. Um, they're gonna break out, they all have to become kind of experts and then they're all gonna do their presentation within smaller groups. So they're gonna cross load information that way. So you're using your PD time for the PLCs? Correct tapping in-house experts, teacher leaders, to, to offer this. And teachers have, a, do they have choice for the PLC that yep. they participate in? Yep. Awesome. So either there's teacher leaders or uh, collectively they're going to create them, make themselves experts. Right. right? Um, so yes, uh, the, the second half of that is that uh, the staff were given a survey this year yep. and they rank their top three choices uh, and then based on space and availability and their interest level, you know, so that we don't have one with 30 people and then a bunch with four. Um, so we'll cross-load based off those interests. 
And th these are the topics we're doing this year is artificial intelligence, really focusing on what does that look like in the classroom, what are the pros, the cons, um, benefits or guardrails that can be put in place, maximizing technology in general, behavior management, communication with parents and students, supporting students with disabilities, interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, and effective teaching strategies. So those are the topics that they'll be engaged in this year. Such a great process. For, yeah. For determining your PD. Oh, it's it's a great process. It was actually Andy and I probably in 2010 in two different districts where we went through the state PLC training when Andy was at Munson and I was at Palmer. And uh, it's a really great model. It's a really good model. Um, right now we have our club fair going on, so those are we're allowing the extracurriculars to be in the cafeteria during lunches to try to um, answer any questions and get more student participation. Our college fair is coming up on October 11th. Uh, this year we're actually going to have about 40 colleges and representatives. We usually, last year I think I reported to 28, 26 showed up. So big jump. Uh, we're going to be moving it out of the hallway and into the, um, into the gymnasium this year. Why the big jump? Um, so Ms. Devine, our um, the guidance department head, just working with some colleagues in other school just districts, um, they were telling her about other ways that they sort of post for interest in different uh, platforms that they use. So she attempted one of those, and it got it sure results. Yeah, yeah, it sure worked. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of high interest. And then finally, the principals youth advisory committee. So we'll be meeting again this year. Last year, uh, the students selected a healthy decisions project, and that was based off of our uh, data from Spiffy. So at risk behaviors. And um, they did uh, information around cigarettes and vaping, healthy relationships, um, and alcohol. So this year, what they at the end of last year, that that group decided that uh, they really wanted to do something around thankfulness or gratitude projects. So we'll we'll see how that develops. Again, it's we try to have it let it be student driven. Um, so in, in addition to that youth advisory, try I try to encourage them to do a, one. The goal is one project sort of campus-wide, culture-wise, um, each year. And then in, on top of that, they're advising on different decisions or different things and getting feedback from them. So it's a worthwhile group um, that I meet with. To try to increase, it's the, you know, that we meet during the school day, during lunch, uh, the restaurant provides pizzas, um, so that I can try to maximize participation. Um, but again, I do have some, some spots to fill, but those are the students who are, who are part of it, as well as Dom. Uh, and whoever the other rep for the, for the trustees will be. Uh, personnel, just some difficult news, but we are posting again for Agnac from Strucker. Um, so we did lose some Strucker that we had. Um, so that posting's gone out. We're trying to work our connections again. Um, and then one thing I wanted to add, though, is I just wanted to give, I, I forgot to put it in here, but uh, the, the Italy group trip, just want to provide an update for all of you. Uh, we're at 59 students. Uh, for the United students that are actively paying uh, and committed to going. We have nine chaperones uh, that'll be going. Our cap is 60. Uh, we were at 52, and then we opened it up to freshman students. So we had seven, uh, not seven freshmen, but we had another senior sign up and about six freshmen. So pretty pretty cool. We got one one, one spot left. Um, and what are the dates for this, job? That's April break April. of 25. You said nine chaperones? Nine chaperones, and it, it shouldn't impact the school unless due to the flights or some kind of shifting that has to happen. It, we, it could take a day or two before or a day or two after, but we'll be we flexible. No. All four no. grades represented? All four grades are represented. Interesting. Yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. All traveling together. Yes. We're so big now that uh, we don't have to double with anybody else. Nice. Um, and they'll be traveling into like um, 30. 30 student size groups with five chaperones yeah. each. We think if we get to six, well, we know if we get to 61 more, it's a definite tenth chaperone. Um, they fundraised already 900 over $900, so they'll continue to fundraise. Right now, it'd be around $750 if they decided to add a chaperone. That's what the out-of-pocket cost would be. Um, and they, I'm encouraging you to look at that if we don't get to the 60, um, just to have that other chaperone. Are the Chaperones all staff. Yes. Big parent, all staff. All staff. That's great. Joe, in that college fair, what what time of day will that be on? That'll be in the afternoons. So it'll be about twelve thirty. Well, one one to two. Twelve thirty. At twelve thirty till the end of the day. Yeah. So it'll be for juniors and seniors. I have a question about vaping. Um, 
that uh, I just want you to answer anecdotally, so not with you know, real data. Okay. Um, I know that the, uh, the student vaping is on the, on the decline nationally. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, when, when my student was here, it, it, you know, everywhere it was just, it, it was an epidemic, it was just so bad, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what had, would you say that students here at Smith Oak are reflecting that national trend where there is a decline in vaping? Yes, I do think that. I mean, we are... The amount of reporting this school year is minimal, um, and the students do report. They, you know, they don't want to be walking in places or see it. Yeah. I will say though, um, I, I think that we are not being helped by industries who are increasingly making vaping products that are less and less detectable oh, okay. and are mimicking real life yeah. uh, items. Yeah. So I think I think there are I mean there's there's sweatshirts with the vaping capability in the hood. Yeah. Uh, there's, so I think I, I think we're working again. There are people working against that trend, you know, to try to make highlighters that are really big pens and things like that that can make it harder to detect. Right, right. and that's where the um, S50 raising awareness comes in to say you may be choosing to do this. Look what it's doing to your body. Look what yes. it's doing to your brain. You know. Make a better choice. Yes. Yeah, so they're aware of them. Um, because there's also that perception. There, there, the, the, there's like a, a lag. The research hasn't caught up to the, to the use, you know, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the harm that it does. Yeah, and I think that um, I've sent stuff out to parents and <clears throat> we talked about it with students. I don't think that they realize that, you know, they, they look at a vape cartridge and they look at it and they, you know, it's like a bottle of water, bottle of water, or cigarette, but <clears throat> they may have. Um, they may be more potent and have a higher nicotine value, but it can still be the same size cartridge. Um, or students are, you know, reporting that they use multiple cartridges in a day. It's like if you were smoking three packs a day. Like it's, it's, a, it's just this, the uh, it's a substance use the scale. Yeah. yeah, the scale. It doesn't yeah. mix in their in their minds. Yeah, and it's know. not just nicotine either. No, the, right? the, the and THC stuff. And everything. Same. Yeah. So hard to hard to find. <laughs> Yep. So I'll go on to the school improvement plan. Um, there really are no change in the goals. So this is just kind of presenting where we're at to the board. Um, the data has not, for MCAS, is, is currently uh, in the preliminary stages, right? So it's kind of, it's embargoed and it's not official. Um, so you'll see I have in there not released um, in those categories. Some update though is on the post-grad plans. Um, you can see lat, what's new to you is the numbers from 2023 and 24. So those are that's new information that's been added into the plan that Which we now have. Category are we? post grad. Plans. Oh, all the way. Yeah, I kind of skipped over those because they're not officially released. Okay. Um, but I we will present it when it's official in October. Mike and I, have, uh, Mr. Parks and I, have already begun <coughs> looking at the data that's in there. Um, Surprising data. I, I, it just, I think it underscores the, the algorithm that the state uses doesn't quite make sense, uh, and how they restructure goals year, over, you know, year to year based off of last year's, and how you know you may be scoring exactly the same, uh, but you don't you get zero points uh, because you didn't improve enough. Um, so it is an interesting system, and I, and I think it does skew results. It's a zero sum game. Um, so you can see in our, you know. The numbers between 23, 24, um, it really, it really underscores the the idea that uh, the percentages are really based off of the students that are in front of you. There's no real, you know, real easy trend to say when you see in 2022 when half of them went to two and four-year colleges, um, and then in 23 we're down to 24 percent. Last year, 35 percent. And this is student intentions as they report. Uh, on their way out graduating where they where they intend to be. Um, and you can see employment is gener generally around 50%, or a little bit higher. Um, military was higher last year. Um, 
the good news is that you know we did get answers from everybody on what they intended over the last two years, so that was a positive. This first uh, item, trade school, two and four year college. Yes. When you say trade school, so they're going on to higher level trade school? Yes, yeah. and that would be okay. their, their intention is to do that full time. Can you give me an example? Sure, that... Ohio Tech, okay. Lincoln Tech. So okay. they might be going on for welding. Yeah, they yeah, might yeah. Be going on more for, specialty, yeah. more, more proficiency. Yeah. proficiency. Okay. Yep. And generally that's when they're reporting that they're going full time, not part time. We, we ask them to do, to report kind of what they're mostly doing. So, you know, there may be students who are, say they're intending to go to uh, employment full time, but they might be taking a business class at night or yeah, some continuing yeah. ed. Uh, the next is the curriculum and instruction. So that first goal, we did do work last year uh, on the 11th to 12th grade crosswalk. And that's, that's another area that we'll continue to um, finalize this school year. Um, investigating the hybrid OSHA, we've continued on with our, our OSHA 10. Um, I'm not sure that this will stay as a goal to be honest with the board, with the uh, school council. Um, it's kind of one of those things that we keep coming back to and thinking about, but uh, one of the things that we've been doing now is uh, really looking at the OSHA 10 as safety training. So we're really trying to look at doing the safety training that makes most sense for that career field. So, you know, in plumbing and electrical, they're doing OSHA 30, they're not really gonna be affected by any kind of OSHA 10. They're already doing the hybrid OSHA 30 with an instructor and with exams. Um, when we look at culinary or some of these other programs, they're doing specialized safety. Uh, you know, and they might be doing it as well as OSHA. Um, and as the students are becoming more and more tech savvy, it's it's not as much as a heavy of a heavy lift. There are some students that we're having to you know unlock. The the benefit of having the, the OSHA 10 on the computer is that they have to, they're going at their own pace. Uh, it's their own work. They're being judged independently. Um, the negatives are that it's not as exciting. It's not as interesting. You're not getting those sort of real life stories that you might get from a teacher or the organic conversations that happen. Um, but again, the pros and cons, you know, cons of having somebody in front of you is a lot of times we're not getting that individual understanding. We're not we're not really assessing whether the student themselves understands the regulations and, and understands how to put them in practice. So that's why we kept coming back to sort of that hybrid. But again, I, I'm not sure if it's going to stay as a priority. Um, with the school council or with the vocational programs, but it might. Um, so investigating the development of an entrepreneurship seminar series. Um, one of the things that we are looking to do this year, uh, and it, so you can see last year we talked about it, but this year we are gonna have a, a human resources panel. So we have a series of contacts, parents and, and others that have contacted uh, so we are going to set that up through guidance to talk to students about prior to the, um, the juniors going through their mock interviews, just to talk about, well, what is a hiring, what do hiring professionals actually look for? Uh, what do they want out of that? So, so that, that's going to get put into place this, into place this year. I have a question about the uh, crosswalk activities. So, yes. Um, that's where, what, what, what's described here is where uh, English teachers will compare what's taught in 11th grade to what's taught in 12th grade and make sure that there's there are no gaps and no redundancy. Is that correct? No. This is crosswalking the entire all subjects. So academic and vocational? So just just folk, just academic. Okay. So it's nine through twelve creating a document. We've done it through nine through tenth and already disseminated it. And it resulted in departments being able to visually see when they're teaching stuff so they can begin to align. So like an example of that is when English and history sort of changed some of the topics they were talking about yeah. so that it would be uh, like you get synergy benefited with synergy with yeah. the books that English yeah. is reading. Yeah. So we're going to do the same thing with 11th and 12th. Another thing that came out of that was because we do disseminate it for the vocational shops, there's been some shops that have shifted some of the topics that they teach maybe about math or other things so that kind of coincides. Um, it also helps when you start changing language. 
uh, you know, so that you know, when they're talking about fractions or different things, you're using similar language or math and vice versa. So, yeah, so the students see the connection. And it saves you in the teaching also. Yes. Yeah, because you're like, oh, you already know this, you learn this in math. I can go right to analyzing this bar graph or these charts, my charts, or whatever in social studies. Right. Because I don't have to teach you how to do that, you already know that. Right. Yeah, that's and right. It, and it's, it's really the goal is to have just it, it there so that they can begin to, you know, independently or as a department, look at those and start making making yeah. better decisions about when they're teaching. Aligning things. So it's just sharing info. That's awesome. Yep. Uh, on assessment, again, the results weren't released, so I don't have any update there. Um, the shop information handouts, we did not have any action there, but that's that will still be that's still a priority because we've had parents ask about it. Again, I think it's it's underscored even more when we have. Uh, a higher amount of students coming in uh, whose parents went the college route and don't understand vocational ed and they want to know how to support their their child and like kind of well what are the real next steps what's licensure where do they go from here uh, because they just don't have that personal frame of reference um, so that that'll still be a priority um, the program of studies that handbook's been updated and we have new templates uh, we're going to be working on the templates that we got out of NEASC feedback around making sure that all the, the shop uh, curriculum templates are all the same. So that will continue to get work done. Um, as, as far as guest speakers, we do have a guest speaker that comes, but we're still looking, uh, and I was working with the youth advisory around that to try to come up with ideas of uh, what would resonate with them. So I'll continue that conversation with this, this group this year. Well, um, the survey that they did, maybe after the team building day, that could help. It might, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then identifying common themes and messaging. Um, you know, the next, we do have the vision of the graduates, so the next step would be around I'm forming an implementation committee to look at policies, protocols, practices, and other areas of opportunity to make sure that people are just asking themselves, how is this fitting in to that vision? Um, and then we'll, we're going to talk about ways to have that messaging go out around campus in student-friendly language and that people can understand. I know the criminal justice stripper word has contacted my son as far as the Superior Court judge to do the future. Yes. Speaker. They're trying to set that up for next month. And, uh, and my other son-in-law is, is involved with the, in, the energy business. So I spoke to the to National Grid gentleman said that uh, they're excited to work with us not only on this project but to work with us for our departments that any way any students out there, they're looking for help like everybody else and if they catch them on the lower level mm -hmm. to groom them to come up uh, it's an advancement for the person as well as the school so that's uh, exciting as well the other thing I wanted to mention is that <clears throat> uh, the day the freshman came in mm -hmm. Oh, I happened to be there, and I happened to hear a, a, a great conversation from a parent that had a student that was coming as a freshman, but also had one that had been here for a couple of years. And their comment was pretty exciting, that they were excited that teenagers don't talk to their parents. They said it's different at Swiss school. Mm -hmm. The kids come home from school when they're in there, whether it's academic or in their vocational week, and they want to tell their parents everything they learned that day. And it's so exciting. And they said, because parents don't get that information normally, not saying anything against regular high school, but they, uh, they just <laughs> get, get jacked up about working with tools, working with people, working on a car, working whatever. But I thought it was very interesting feedback mm -hmm. from a parent to say they're getting that at home. So thanks to your Thank you. teachers. and and uh, they're, they're really doing their job that the parents are talking about. Sure. I got one. Yes. Um, for instance, this last page here, 2023 update, it got written with vision. So these items that were incorporated in 2023, mm -hmm. you still carry those forward? Yes. Okay. The, goal, I, I, the goal is to carry them forward. Yeah, goal, okay. Yep. So, so some of these other pages, um, no action. Um, but the intent is whatever you develop, you're going to try to carry forward unless 
try to you yeah. determine it's not working. Yes. Like, um, you were mentioning how we notice a thing may be evolved. Right? Yes. Um, more comment. Ben, I applaud you for sticking around, but you don't really need to. I've got to get this time, man. <laughs> okay. I'm, uh, can't, my can't get the project going until it gets And I, I'm surprised Tom is still sticking around. Well, you get to learn a different side of Snowfall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're the committee report. Yes. yes. Um, first is a policy subcommittee report. Uh, well, the policy subcommittee did not formally meet, but I was briefed on the proposed updates to our Title IX policy to align with the new regulation from the U.S. Department of Education, which took effect August 1st. Title IX bars sex discrimination in federally funded schools and colleges. Um, the new rule expands Title IX beyond sex-based harassment to many additional aspects of sex discrimination, such as disparate treatment based on sex in all aspects of K-12, like grading, educational opportunities, discipline, athletics, and more. It also requires school districts to actively monitor programs and activities for sex discrimination, identify barriers to reporting, and address them. As a result, we might be seeing more Title IX cases than we're used to. All schools are required to have a process for students and staff to submit a Title IX complaint and a procedure for how the school investigates and resolves it. Under the new regulation, school districts must designate a Title IX coordinator, investigator, and decision maker, which can be three separate people or one person filling all three roles. The people in those positions are responsible for steering the complaints through the investigation process. The Title IX coordinator is also responsible for ensuring all students, staff, and parents understand their rights under Title IX and how they can submit Title IX complaints. Ultimately, the new regulation should make things easier for districts, especially small ones like ours, uh, because it simplifies staffing requirements and allows districts to hop handle a broader swath of conduct complaints under the same grievance process. Um, so you, you'll see that on our uh, agenda under the new business section, so that's a little uh, context for that. And um, I'd like to also report on the data <coughs> and strategic planning work that Dr. Lincoln Hoper and I did when we met in August. We identified next steps coming out of the board retreat in July and then visited the MSBA website to understand the process for projects getting into that pipeline. Um, we learned that the MSBA is required to conduct periodic school surveys to understand the conditions of public schools in Massachusetts. Three surveys have been completed so far in 2005, 2010, and 2016. The survey data is one of the tools that the MSBA uses when assessing applications for funding. Um, they're working towards completing the next survey with the report scheduled for release in December 2025. So that is happening right now. Um, the three categories. The MSBA survey evaluates our building condition, so uh, they assess seven site and 18 building systems. Uh, the second one is general environment, which encompasses learning environment, building safety, accessibility, academic and program sufficiency, and instructional technology. And then the third category is capacity utilization, where they determine average, um, under, or over utilization. And of course, vocational and agricultural schools have their own benchmarks in terms of the capacity, right? So you'll see all these categories reflected in our district improvement plan. Um, our fourth goal um, from the retreat was the physical campus, right? Um, Dr. Lincoln Hoker has also obtained the engineers and architects reports on debuilding, which the board can utilize as part of the campus wide feasibility study that we identified as a strategic priority for the retreat. And we also plan to review student enrollment trends as well as the Bureau of Labor Statistics data as our next So correct me if I'm wrong in what you just said. We're currently in the pipeline for review? No, we just wanted to see what the pipeline looked like. <coughs> you mentioned 2025. So they do a survey of, the, the MSBA is what comes yeah, yeah. capital projects, right? Mm -hmm. So they do a survey of all the schools in the common. And the last time they did it was in 2016. Yeah. And so there was a big lag, right? Um, and so they're about to do another one. So they're, we're going to be one of the schools that is. Like, 
2007. And so they're they're tasked to do all the schools. Yeah, because they, they they then report on this is the condition of our of our school buildings in the great state of Massachusetts, and they use that date so it's to, to both of those things, right? To say here's a picture. So, it's, I can show you it's like, Yeah, yeah, cool. we're going to need to talk. Here's to a about picture this. of oh. schools <laughs> in Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if your school is in the pipeline or funding from the MSBA, they're going to look at their own data as one of the determining factors of your eligibility to receive the funding. So if this is all happening, coming up, and we're being pretty proactive yeah. starting to move forward, hopefully the stars will align. And it's pretty, it's pretty, it's broad brush strokes yeah, yeah, their yeah. survey. Not yeah, I gotta imagine if we got to do right. all the schools. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But <laughs> so now, all right, that's great data. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And the feasibility, the, the architecture reports too. That from 2016. Um, no, from 2019, right? I think it was 2019. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Yeah. So those are a great resource for us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Craig, we'd like to hear from you. Sorry, I took your way. Not at all. Well, good evening. Um, as Dr. Lynn Hooker had mentioned, um, the project has seen some unexpected um, conditions over the last three weeks to four weeks. Um, I'll give you a little more detail what that means. Um, so on July 23rd, as the contractor was basically bringing the site down to its design elevation, that's stripping down material, they started to uncover what was thought to be organic material. Um, the concern from the contractor was it might be oil or other contaminants, so we had to bring our envir your environmental consultant back in um, to investigate that um, further. The information that was gathered was that was not oil or VOC, but was simply fly ash from previous usages on the property. Um, and fly ash is a pretty common, um, they don't like to use pollutant, but contaminant that is found in soils and has to be managed on site. So once you find it, it's very difficult to work with it unless you have a place to store it or you pay to have it removed. So in those cases, it was very expensive. So what we started to do was look at the properties of the material. Could the material still be used structurally or was it just unusable and we had to abandon any use of that? soil. Um, through OTO, who's the environmental and the geotech, um, a report was created. Um, that material was evaluated and through some steps that the engineer had um, directed us to do, we were able to take that material, amend it, remove the material, add additional material, and make that soil structurally sound to be used again. So. Yeah. A lot, lot of material, a lot of information, but with it, Craig, I just jumped in a second. Sure. Um, just the fly ash um, is used in concrete now. What is the fly? What, what it's, is, it's, it's just a term. It's, ter it's a term of a uh, uh, burnt product, basically. Boundaries. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's here's, here's a good snapshot. Fly ash is a byproduct of coal fired coal fired power plants that we can use in concrete to improve its performance and sustainability. And it, doing this whole thing about concrete is very uh, carbon heavy to produce, cement, blah, blah, blah. They're looking at all these additives, slags, fly ash, and trying to come up with this premium mix and, and make it. And now there's a facility starting to develop in um, Hoyo, the kind of the green concrete plant. Yes. I don't know about any details, you know very little about it, but this whole industry is is being targeted. So fly ash can be used in concrete. And basically it's it's stuff that was burnt on site somewhere that was dumped there through the years. It, in some cases it's foundry, actually metal work and, and you did metal work back in the day in the back portion of the of the building. So possible it's part of that old founder. Um, but so in discovering that, it stopped the site work. It brought engineering into the mix and it took about three weeks for a final testing and um, 
an uh, amendment plan to be created. Um, during that time, nothing was happening for the foundation work or the um, slab work, which was all critical path, meaning that it was scheduled to start in October and it was planned on being done in November. We have currently about a 37-day delay in our schedule. We can't afford that. We can't afford that, and we have to find ways of decreasing that. Yeah. So we started with a meeting with the contractor this morning. Um, he started at 44 days. We got down to 37 days to start first meeting. Um, we've installed the camera um, on e-building. Um, Keep an eye on things, and it's a time-lapse camera, so we can look back and see what work's done, when it's done, and how long it took. Do they know they're being recorded? Oh, yes. Okay, good. They, Absolutely. they watched us install it, and they asked okay. a bunch of questions, so it's, yeah, everyone's aware. Um, it's not capturing any student activity. It right. is directed purely at the site. Right. So by doing that, we will now monitor their progress. We're saying that 37 days, we understand they believe it's 37 days, and we will continue to fight and take back each and every one of those days as we move forward. Um, but for the current time, the schedule shows a turnover to the school, a certificate of, of occupancy, on July 18th, 2025. So it is into the school year, which is not what we intended on doing. We wanted to turn this over in May, allowing time for our students and faculty to get going and, and get the space up to, to, you know, to its running condition. So currently, we, we have to try to find that meeting between paying extra staff, pushing the contractor to bring in extra staff, and trying to improve the schedule through monitoring them as well as giving them opportunities to make up. So weekend work, uh, an extra two hours in the evening, add a, a piece of equipment, anything that, that can be done will be done, and we will continue to track. But for the moment, we have to accept that there is potential of a delay and what that number will be six months from now is different than what it will be today. Is it the biggest issue that we have to spend the funds by June 30th? We do, but we have a variety of funds. We have insurance funds, we have donation funds, and we have grant have funds. And they don't have the same July, June 30th? Correct. So okay. we spend the grant monies first right. with those deadlines, and then the insurance money, the donation money, is used to kind of pick up at the last two months of the project. So then the other big issue that you're identifying in this delay is that that the students and faculty won't be able to get into the building before the end of the school year. Is that what you said? Correct. Yes. yes. Yeah. Current. It will crunch our schedule from mid-July to the first day of school. That time is now very tight. To do the whole transition. To make sure we're ready for the end. And then the spaces that they leave, get those ready for wherever. Okay, thank you. It's going to make things pretty difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Hindsight, of course, but would it have made sense to do like ground, you know, soil testing or bore testing? It was all done. And it just wasn't so if bad. You rewind a year. Yeah. Back when you still had a beautiful hill with grass and trees and a field and fence line and all of that, um, bringing a drill rig up onto that hillside and creating problems for the trees was a challenge. So we only could get so far up onto that hillside, and unfortunately. That hillside is where everything lies. I've got a 1940s Ford um, hubcap. I've got a 1930s Coke bottle. I've got a sole of a shoe. Thousands um, of bottles. Uh, thousands of bottles. Clone bottles. Uh, anything you could possibly think of. It, somewhere along the line, someone decided that it was a good place to put some stuff. We should put our resident historian on that um, question of why all those bottles. I they did do soil investigation, unfortunately, but Frank just explained it. We missed you, it. You could have 10,000 square feet, you could decide to do Swiss cheese with your geotech, and you could miss the one pocket that could cost you money. We did a number of geotech borings, we went back and did more, we went back and did environmental, so it seems like the areas in which the material was present was areas we could not get access to. 
So hindsight, I would have cut the trees down, and we would have done the, the geotechs on the entire site. But most schools do not like to take down trees. You know, if they can help it. Especially so. in what they do. <laughs> yeah, I really love it. So some exciting news. Um, so we are back on course now. We're, we're starting. So Wednesday and Thursday, they're pouring foundations. Um, they'll be starting underground plumbing work in the next two weeks. Um, slab work is right now scheduled for December. That's a very bad time for, for pouring concrete. We're doing everything we can to get that back into November. But there are also um, winter conditions, as, as uh, Dr. Lincoln Homer mentioned, that we'll have to take into account that would protect the slab during that work. So it's not that we couldn't do the work, it would just cost more than um, So we are not back on schedule, we're back in progress and we're moving forward. For the last three weeks we have been doing a lot of treading water. Um, so we're very happy that we're on again, and Tyre is seems to be pushing very hard. So we will continue to push them even harder. You, you've managed a lot of projects. <laughs> how how on how uh, just a rough percentage of them do you bring a camera? Put a camera. It's a trend. Yeah. It's standard operating procedure now. Is it? It was five years ago. Just it is now. It's just insurances are, are requiring it. Um, it's just Everybody's got an indoor valve. <laughs> yes. Something yeah. blows off a site, it breaks a window, no one, I have no idea, you go back to the camera, it's there. Hopefully it's there. <laughs> uh, every project you mean of substance at UMass has a camera on a building nearby, hooks down, and I think most of them are live. So this is time lapse. It's a time lapse. So at the end of this, we'll be able to give you an entire building project in 15 minutes. Also, um, yeah, we'll we be able to access it currently. Mm -hmm. Is it active yet? It is. Okay. So. So I think Andy has been given an invitation. I will have Gary, if you would like one, where yes, I can send it to you, um, and you can watch it at any point. It's entertaining. And the people like um, like Kiter is isn't offended or insulted or feels disrespected. He was at first. He was curious why the camera was going up, um, and we simply said that because this contract doesn't allow us to be on site full time, we needed to be able to monitor while we weren't here, and we wanted to do some marketing afterwards, which is their fault. So he's not offended anymore. He was concerned that we might have been. Watching him, I, I think the word he used was big brother. Big yeah. brother, yeah, yeah absolutely. But that sense, we've given well, them access to the camera so they can see it just as much as we can and, and benefit from it. They'll become a comment. Yeah, I'm just going to let me just add on to that. Scott and I have had our fair share of one -on -one conversations through all of this, uh, and I do respect Scott a lot. Just one particular topic that talks about that all. So, bigger concerns as far as the soil. That was the issue. But that was my, my initial concern too. When Craig came to me to ask about the camera, I'm thinking, how is this going to work? <coughs> from my level, it hasn't been an issue. Contractors will sometimes want them up themselves for their own purposes yeah, exactly. uh, as well. So, I'm sure. But I think for that purpose, it will give you a nice marketing film at the end that you can use for phase two. Um, and it will also give us an opportunity to just be there when we're not there. It would be a really cool teaching tool again, yeah, also here at this vocational school. You could share it with yeah. classes, yes. Absolutely. Any other questions? Thank you, Greg. Well, thank, thank you all for your support. support. Yeah. Debbie, thank you so much for all your help. You've been great. We'll miss you. Okay. Unfortunately, Tim couldn't be here this evening. He had some family things to do with. Sends a text and I can read it here for um, So on the companion animal, we've already talked about, we did get the occupancy permit, students are moving things in. Uh, the only thing that we have to touch on uh, to finish up the project, um, you'll see on the back side where the, the outdoor run is, there's some steps, there's a railing, we have a temporary railing up there so to pass final inspection, we have a permanent rail to go up. And in addition to that, uh, the snow stops have to be finished. Uh, so 
otherwise we're just about done there. The Apple storage roof has been completed. Uh, it's great. It's also waiting with, with snow stops. Uh, Northern Tree, uh, we've been uh, contracting with Northern Tree. Some of the, the pine trees out uh, in front uh, by Route 9, uh, they have to come down. I think there's three of them. Uh, so Tim's been working with Northern Tree, has also been working with DPW, who agrees that these trees have to come down. Unfortunately, from our perspective, uh, these trees are not in the city's tree belt. Uh, so, of course, the cost is on this. Anyways, we're, we're taking care of those. Eventually, there's also some pines between uh, the C building and the hospital. Uh, and those have to be tended to as well. So, uh, and our horticulture? Uh, you would not want the, li the liability of cutting trees down. Because it's too to big of a... Yeah, we're not going to be better off. I was thinking the same thing. So, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And your finance report is in, in your report. So let's go to new business. May I have a motion a second to approve the facility use rate updates. Uh, they're in your packet. So moved. Second. Second. Further discussion? Yeah, what should we know about these? So really, you'll see some language changes. So mostly just job titles, updating that. Uh, but on the third page of the document, you'll see uh, just updating the cafeteria. Uh, staff rate, the IT staff rate, and then on the, on the last page, the field prep rates. Uh, so we get our practice is uh, this, these are rates that we charge to outside groups, uh, if they have to use any of these services, we want to make sure that the rate covers the actual cost of our potential staff covering this particular event. So we look at the, the highest potential rate of any of our custodians, as an example, so if the highest paid custodian happens to be on duty, it has to be paid at that rate, we want to make sure that that, that cost is covered. So uh, it's simply updating those ways to make sure that our, our services are covered. Who um, generated these new rates? It's simply looking at the current current payroll. Okay. Um, I can tell you that we're going to have to look at the current payroll and see if there's any changes there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank all in favor? Aye. We have a motion, and may I have a motion and a second to approve the updated Title IX policy? So moved. Second. Further discussion? Do, just a comment um, that the practice is that we're moving away from the word grievance and we're using the word resolution. Okay. Just, a, just a language twist. And that's MASD. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to do Title IX resolution procedures? Further discussion? No. All in favor? Okay. So is, that, is that what we... I, that, our attorney would not recommend that. Can you I say think the grievance more? procedure is separate from the informal resolution process. Okay. So I think... Uh, that's not what our counsel told us. I know, okay. I think he, but he's also advising... I don't mean to throw just, just under the bus, but <laughs> he's also... He told us not to adopt the MASC policies that they put out because there are some issues with it. So I don't know. That was just because I had pulled those, given them to Andy, and then when Justin sure. had advised differently. So it's interesting. Well, it's going to change after November. <laughs> and we've got faith in our council. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, I think Justin is out, but Justin especially in that firm yes. has specialized in Title IX. Okay. You know, I think it's so new to everyone. I, yes. I guess we could like amend it, you know, if we have to, but... Yeah, it, it, it doesn't change the procedure, it's just, it's just the, 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 the language. language. No, yeah, yeah. It's just the terminology, yeah. so we can keep it as it is. It's not kind of a mute point. All right. Any other questions? Turn back to all in favor. Yeah. Aye. 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 Thank you. The proposed national grid we already did. The next one is may I have a motion to second to approve the to add chapter 70 funds increase of eight thousand eight hundred and six dollars to the public relations line. So moved. A little explanation, please. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. So Smith Vocational. Uh, I guess we are fortunate enough to receive some more money from Chapter 70, uh, a whopping $8,006. And uh, so this money is coming to the school. 
this was obviously something that was during the budget process, and we have to now allocate this money into our budget. And uh, my, my recommendation to the board would be that we allocate it to the public relations. So, again, step further back, I think, to, to answer your question, Mr. Parker. As we might, Chapter 70 money is the state money that comes through Northampton to us to support the Northampton students here. Uh, so this is separate from the non-resident tuition money that we get from the non-resident students. And, and why did you choose PR? That in one particular line that we cut, uh, if you recall back in the springtime, we were short in our budget, and uh, we had to close that gap. That was one particular line that we did cut. Um, but again, unfortunately, you know, we have to have a PR line, and a lot of my counterparts you know, always tell me, tease me that they wish they could have a PR budget line. I always say I wish I didn't have to have a PR budget line. Uh, so it's just one of those expenses that we have to have. And I'd hate to, to cut back too much and then have an impact on that. Okay. The next, may I have a motion to second? We oh, we didn't go. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. This one is, may I have a motion to second to approve the payment of $1,594.25 to an employee incorrectly paid in, by, in FY24. Second. Second. How was this discovered? So uh, this was a relatively new hire, and uh, this individual, uh, long story short, uh, has a bachelor's degree. Uh, during the time of hire, uh, there was a request and not a giving of, of the staff person's transcripts to verify that he had a bachelor's degree. So he inadvertently was put in the column of a non-bachelor's degree educator. Uh, every year at returning, 